I first met Piero about eight years ago, and we were both invited to speak at the same conference. And uh, at some point during the conference, maybe in one of the meetings in between, uh, he noticed uh, the tattoo that I have on my uh, fist here. It says Krom. He's like, does that say Krom? And I'm like, yeah, Conan's God. And uh, so we started talking about Conan the Barbarian and instantly bonded over it. And uh, so I've known him for years, and he actually got my uh, book, uh, The Way of Men and Becoming a Barbarian, published in France. Uh, Piero is one of the biggest uh, authors on survivalism in all of Europe. His books have been published in Turkish, in a bunch of other languages. And uh, so we're happy to have him here, speaking at the 21. Thank you. Thank you. Dzień dobry. Yeah, I'm sure you figure out it means uh, good morning in Polish. Uh, Poland, as you figure out, I'm sure it's a great country. First time I was here, 1993, with my Polish girlfriend. She was in Switzerland. We came here, we visited the whole country. I did a big mistake, not dumping her, that was okay, but not coming here and living here, because this is, this is an awesome country. Uh, now, the other day when I came here, I was also happy that here no one knows me. Although one of my books is com are coming out in Polish uh, in September, but so far no one knows me. And when I arrived, people in the hotel started to come and, and talk to me. And that usually happens to me all, every day in Switzerland or France. But, uh, but I was surprised here in Poland. Of course, it was some of you who didn't know me and say, hey, have you reached Cooper? I said, no. <laughs> he's, he's more handsome than me. So yeah, my name is uh, Piero San Giorgio. I'm, uh, I'm Swiss, uh, originally Italian. I've uh, been writing books for the last um, nine years, one of which has been a super bestseller, translated into English, uh, Italian, indeed Turkish, Polish, uh, Romanian, Arabic, uh, uh, Russian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, but that that's not all my life, of course. Before that, uh, I've worked in about 20 years in the software industry. Uh, I made my first million dollars when I was 27. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur, I've sold my company, uh, I'm married, four kids. Uh, so I've had, had the life. So it's also based on this experience that I take what I'm trying to explain to you today. So since the dawn of time, of course survival was paramount for for the tribes of, of men and women and children that uh, lived uh, or tried to live as, as much as possible in mostly the wild. And uh, in those tribes, because it was the it was an evil patriarchy, who was taking all the risks, uh, planning the future, defending the tribe, defending themselves, defending the women and the children? It was mostly the men, right? And one of the things that are important when you want to survive and prepare uh, to defend your tribe, yourself, your, your woman, is of course think about the future, think ahead. So over time, the people who were careless, who didn't think, well, natural selection got rid of them because they couldn't pass their genes because they, they got caught sleeping by the saber-toothed tiger or they got, they got caught unprepared by a storm or they, missed, uh, or they got uh, invaded by, uh, by a conquering tribe that killed them, killed the man and fucked the woman. That's, his, that's how it worked. So today, even, we have still natural catastrophes. We still have problems that need to be thought ahead of time. And while in the past, the women were extremely grateful for men preparing and surviving and so on, this is not so much the case today, because after all, 
who's the biggest hero, who's the biggest savior of all, today it's the nanny state. The state will hand you money, they will help you. So as men, we're not enticed as much as before to prepare for whatever future, whatever risks of the future happens. And yet, I know, because it's for me and it's for everyone I know and I know it's for you, deep down inside, we want to protect our lives, of course, our women, our children, but also our community and our tribe, right? We want deep down inside. It, unfortunately, it's not recognized as, as important as it used to be. So, what I must warn you before I really start to summarize 400 pages of my first book in, in 25 minutes, is that our collective imagination, our collective unconscious has been programmed willingly or unwillingly by the media, by movies. And we think about survival when we look at these movies with catastrophes, you know, ice age that happens in two weeks, or uh, uh, zombies ap apocalypse, all this, all this thing which may be enjoyable and fun and entertaining, but usually has, have nothing to do with reality. They have nothing to do with, uh, there may be a, 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 an insight here and there that is useful, but generally speaking, we, we really have to deprogram ourselves from this heroic, one man saves the world, um, global catastrophe happening in two days kind of mindset. It's worse than that to the reality, but it's also more doable. If I have one thing, only one thing that I'd like you to remind from, to, from my presentation is just that. Think by yourself. Don't believe what I'm going to say. If you uh, make me happy by reading my books, don't believe what I write in my books. Check the facts. As in everything in your life, take control of it by thinking first by yourselves. If you're here today, it's probably because you're already quite ahead in that process. So don't believe what people say. Try, test it, and then make your own opinion. Because it's your life. I'm not responsible for you. I'm, I don't give a fuck. I only give a fuck about me and the, my tribe and the people around me. But I like you. Therefore, <laughs> I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to, to tell you what I think. OK. Now, this graph is probably the most important graph ever. And it should be on first page of every news, uh, on front presentation of every newsreel every day. It's the evolution of population since for the last 12,000 years. It took us more than 10,000 years to reach half a billion people in the world. Then it took from, from about uh, the year 1000 to the year uh, 1800 to add another half a, mil half a billion people. From 1815, it took 100 years to 1913 to add 1 billion more people in the world. And then 1 more billion to 1930, and, and so on. When I was born, 1971, yeah, I'm old, uh, population was about 5 billion. Now we're 8, more or less. Actually, no one really knows, but we're about 8. So this exponential growth of people is, is, is super important. Because the question is, how, how are those people actually going to feed themselves in the future? And this is not stopping. We are planning to be 10 billion people by two, 2050. That's the, and it's done. I mean, it's on, if we get to 2050, that's it. We're going to be 10 billion people. So the question, is, the question is not, is it too much? Is it not too much? By definition, if they are alive, it means there are resources for these people. The question that, it, that comes is, yeah, but how fast are these, as are these resources uh, getting consumed? Are they renewable? Yes or no? Do we produce them enough? Yes or no? A lot of people, starting from Malthus in the late uh, 18th century, theorized that if the resources consumption, therefore the people, grows exponentially, you have to have resources production also growing exponentially, at least at the same level. And he predicted that it would not happen. So he was wrong, at least for the moment, because obviously the resource production did increase. With the re Industrial Revolution, with the harnessing of coal power and then oil, we managed to move stuff, produce uh, incredible amounts of, uh, of, of food, of, of energy, and move it around the world to today's globalized world where we can have avocados, mangoes, any time of the day and night, everywhere in the world. Amazing consumption of energy today, 
to provide us a quality of life that even kings of a hundred years ago would never dream of. I mean, every one of us here has a life better than the one of kings of a few centuries ago, much better, with less pain, with incredible medical treatments. Our teeth, except for British, are great. <laughs> and um, yeah, dentistry has not improved since the Middle Ages in England, but that's okay, no, I'm joking. But, but our quality of life is just amazing. I mean, imagine your life a thousand years ago, okay? But the question is, can this, contain, can this continue with resources? So it's not about theory. Let's look at the data. And of course, I can look at this very detailed, um, I, give a look, I give a very detailed analysis in my books, but we see that the oil, which is the most important resource that we have today available, because this is what produces food, this is what moves food and goods across the world, well, we start to see decrease of production over time. So country by country, region by region, oil field by oil field, and I got this data from geologists in the oil companies that I used to sell software to. Well, we see that the production start to decrease. So then you have to say, well, then are we ha finding new discoveries? Well, when you look at the data, you find that we almost have no more discoveries of oil since, well, the, the peak was 1964, but since the 1980s, the new discoveries of oil are insignificant compared to the growth of our consumption and demand. So what this means if, if, is that uh, the, the reserves are decreasing. So if you discover less and you still consume more, eventually you deplete your reserves. So of course, the, there has been some new technologies that enable us to seek a little bit more oil in the 2000s, in the last, uh, in the last 20 years, this famous uh, shale oil and, and with the fracking technologies and so on. But this only buys us a little time. So one fact is, eventually, we are running out of this. It doesn't mean that there's no more, but it means that it's going to be very expensive to reach it and very energy intensive to, to extract and use it. Does it mean it's the end of the world? No. Does it mean that we can't find other technologies? Maybe, but we're not sure. And what is for sure is that the world's demand for energy because of growth of consumption keeps increasing. Asia, uh, India, Africa, everyone wants to live like an American, of course because everyone sees on TV the, the highest levels of consumption, and because of our mimetic brain, we want the same. We want the same cars, we want the same uh, fake boobs, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, for our wives. We want the same kind of consumption that we see on TV. And from the village in, Nairo the, 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 in the suburb of Nairobi, Kenya, to uh, the cities of China, to the cities of Latin America, everyone wants the same and wants to consume the same. So we, ha we see growth in demand for energy, for goods, for, and therefore food and, and transport. And this is huge. And I remember traveling. I worked five years in Africa. And Africa is, is a, when I started to go there, I, I can remember my, my, dissonance, um, my cognitive dissonance because I was expecting to go into very poor places. And that's what we still receive from the media. And there are some very poor places. But you go into cities like Lagos, like Nairobi, like Johannesburg, these cities are huge, and they consume, and there's trucks bringing food. It's just the same as Los Angeles, London, with differences, of course, but the consumption levels are starting to be really Western style and, great, and great, and people, and people want to, to have fun and go out at night. And, you know, it, it, the consumption is just immense everywhere in the world. It's mind-boggling. And when we start to look at the depletion of resources, you can take every single raw material, source of energy that exists or that we need, and you see the same kind of, um, of graph, that we are consuming most of what there is, and now the reserve starts to drop. And this is a process that has already started uh, a decade ago in, for most, most materials. Some we have still for, for longer, but some we're getting really short of, you know, copper, uh, um, iron ore, bauxite, the, and then you have to see the quality because people say, oh, but we have coal for, for 200 years. Yeah, but it's low quality coal. It's not the high quality coal. The same as for oil. 
we have the cheap oil that you find in Saudi or in Nigeria, well, it's decreasing very fast. You still have expensive oil, such as the one you get from tar sands and, and, and with fracking technologies, but it's more expensive. And then you have the Arctic oil, which we still need to go and exploit, but it's going to be very expensive. So add to this the fact that our food production is extremely dependent on energy and on mechanization and transportation, where today we have in Western countries one or two percent of the people that are feeding 98 or 99 percent of the others. And you need fleets of trucks, of ships that carry all this food to your supermarket in the city. Young people, especially children today, if you don't teach them where food comes from, if you don't take them to the countryside, they don't, they don't know. They have nev nev never seen a cow or a field. They, they think food grows in the supermarket. They, they have no clue. And, and my generation still lived in the countryside a lot. And, and, and I, I remember my grandparents working in the fields. And, and I'm not that old, but, but today no one, no one does that. The problem of intensive agriculture to feed 8 billion and growing people is that we're destroying the soils. So that's another resource that is decreasing. It's fertile land because of lack of water and the destruction of the soils. Lack of water is very, is very um, acute in uh, Southern Europe, in, in America. You know, the Colorado River sometimes doesn't even reach the, the, the ocean anymore. Same in China. The, I think it's the Yellow River doesn't arrive to the, to the ocean anymore. The Nile has problems. Everywhere in the world where you need water, uh, it's not so much human consumption, but it's to grow food. We, you have big stress on, on water supplies and water quality. Uh, without water and destruction of land, we're actually starting to, to see that the growth of the productivity of the fields across the world has reached a plateau and is starting to decrease. So once again, how are we going to feed so many people without uh, such a growth um, in, in yields for, for land productivity and the energy to, to, to produce the food and to carry it around? So another byproduct of this massive growth of consumption is that you have a lot of shit to take care of after you consume, from plastic to, to, to your uh, garbage and so on. I, and, and that's something I've seen, and it's very sad indeed in, in many countries. No, you don't see it in Western, in Western Europe, you don't see it in, uh, in, in, in the big cities of America, but as soon as you get outside in the periphery, you see that we're turning the world into a huge garbage dump. Uh, in, in, in some, some of the cities, have mountain, literally mountains of garbage in the, in the, in the suburbs. In the, and the suburbs, I don't mean the suburbs like in the US where you have a lot of houses. I mean really the, 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 the areas where, that are outside the cities and trucks just dump uh, tons and tons of, 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 of garbage. And you have to add to this the pollution, pollution of the air, pollution that all this industry produces. Now in Western Europe, we are not producing anything anymore, so we don't have that pollution anymore. We've outsourced it in China, in India, in Africa, in Latin America. But globally speaking, we are destroying ecological niches. And that means that the, the systems that provide the animals and the, 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 all the insects that enable food production in, in reality are being, are being destroyed. And we are polluting oceans and overfishing them to scales that are almost beyond the renewable in many cases. Not to mention the deforestation that you see. And you see species decreasing. Now, fuck climate change. <laughs> if you are going to get poisoned by pollution and there is no more food growing. I mean, they talk about pie in the sky change of climate maybe in 100 years. And I'm old enough to have no, I've seen no climate change in my life. And they used to talk about glaciation when I was a kid, and now it's about, oh, we're going to die. In fi no, I, I think it's bullshit. Well, I don't really know, but I smell bullshit. However, what I know, because I've seen it, is that we are destroying environments all over the world, especially far away from our eyes in the Western world. And this is going to have an impact on the food production and the number of animals that exist. And we already see an impact, because in the countries that global consumption and local mismanagement has turned into shitholes, you start to have people who cannot feed themselves. And this has increased in the 70s. Now, while global poverty has actually decreased, we start to have pockets of overpopulation 
and uh, really food supply problems. And usually, when people are starving, they fight for resources. And when they fight for resources, they get angry and stupid. And when they get angry and stupid, they get caught by the stupidest of ideologies. Usually it's socialism, but sometimes it's, it's as, as something else. I'm trying to be politically correct. I don't know about the censorship. But anyway, or they move. If you, if you don't have any resources, you, know, you don't have perspective, you move to places you, you think that you will have. So you start to have these massive invasions of people moving from one place to another. And um, this is just the beginning. This is just, just the beginning. And I was saying this 10 years ago, and people were saying, ah, but come on. Then you, know, you had the invasion of 200, 2015. And we're paying for it, which is amazing. And which brings crime, which brings uh, terrorists. In London, you know, one knife attack every hour. I mean, it's crazy. You have, you have you know, tensions. And, uh, and of course, you start to have the problems of, of multiculturalism. Multiculturalism, multiculturalism means multi-racism, means multi-conflict. This is why in Poland, you have any terrorism in Poland? No, okay? So politicians and leaders don't say, to, don't worry. We're going to solve all these problems by growth. That's what they sell when they want to be elected. I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend money. This is going to bring growth. I will uh, increase programs. And with me, you're going to have uh, less unemployment. We're going to create jobs. How are you going to create jobs with less energy in the future, with, with uh, less resources, and with more and more uneducated people growing in the world? They have a solution. <laughs> it's borrow money. Actually, they don't even borrow. They create it. They create it from thin air. I take the example of what is still the, the number one economy in the world, well, at least financially, the uh, United States of America. The, the debt, the borrowing of money has just kept increasing. And you think that from 2008 to, to in the last 10 years, there's been more money created in the US than in all the history of the country. Have you seen a doubling of airports, uh, roads, uh, bridges in America in the last 10 years? No. This money has been created from thin air and has been using to keep the economy growing and afloat. When I did my first research for the books in 2008 and 9, you needed to invest $3 <coughs> to create one additional dollar of growth of GDP in the country. Now we are at 14. You need to invest $14 in the economy to get one back. Anyone who's an entrepreneur knows that this can't continue. And this is just the national debt, 24 billion, oh, sorry, trillion, 24,000 billions. Imagine that. Uh, you can't. No one can. Uh, in debt. But you have to add the companies, the public, the credit cards, the student loans. When you add all together, you're close to 1,000 trillion dollars in debt. Impossible to be reimbursed ever. So one day, this is going to collapse. Now, are they going to do it hard, like Germany did in 1947, year zero, as they call, where suddenly they said, money is, doesn't, is worth zero, and we issue a new one. And if you had money, fuck you. Are they doing that? Or will they manage this badly and create hyperinflation? I, was, I must say I was wrong in my analysis in 2011. Because I was expecting this to happen very soon, but it still hasn't. It means that people are really dumb to believe that the money is still worth something. But, you know, until there is energy, if you believe a fantasy, you can keep believing it. So it's continuing. And just to give you perspective, the debt of America today is much higher than any time in the past that they had wars compared to the GDP. So it's not just absolute numbers that are incredibly insanely unsustainable, it's if you compare them to, the, to the, the growth of the economy, because some people say, yeah, but the economy now is much more big, is much more solid than in the past. Yeah, but the debt is even bigger in proportion. So you have to, you have to take that into account. So usually, it ends up very bad. Hey, this is not new. It happens 
thousands of times in history. You can go back to Roman Empire and it's very well documented how they debased currency and it, it contributed to the collapse of the currency over time and people you know, borrowing the real uh, silver coins uh, because the, the, the ones that were circulating were bad, were full of copper. Well, printing money is, even, is, is just as bad on a, on a bigger scale. Germany in the 1910, uh, 1919-1920s, uh, they had the hyperinflation and you had, uh, you had uh, uh, people buying bread with, uh, with, um, with kilos of, of, of money, uh, piles, of, piles of money to buy uh, the simplest things. Yugoslavia, just before the war, uh, had a, also a big, uh, before it exploded, they had lots of hyperinflation. And I lived personally in Zimbabwe for a while, while they had the crisis was 1997 to 98. And uh, I've seen what happens when uh, you know, people don't trust the money and the government fixes prices and no one wants to sell because the, they don't want to sell into the local currency. They only accept foreign, foreign dollars or something. Well, uh, people go insane. There's no more food. People starve in the streets. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. I've seen lots of shit in Africa, <laughs> I can tell you. And, and usually this brings down the real economy. And then you don't have production, and then you have unemployment, which you should add to today's situation where in Europe, for example, it's a bit less so in the US, but still, we don't produce anything anymore. Even if you have large brands, everything is produced elsewhere. So we're in the service world, and the serv service world is extremely dependent on government handouts, on um, on jobs that are dependent on, 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 on the finance, and if the finance goes bad, well, you'll have big, big, big time unemployment. And this, this of, of course, is something that people don't like. And, uh, of course, we're still in a system because we live in a fraudulent system where you have a sort of socialist system for the very, very, very powerful uh, companies and rich people. Not, you know, they're not dumb. They know that the government will help them, so they buy, they buy politicians so that the politicians bail them out when there is a problem. So you have this weird system where while we're very liberal, and it's a good thing, on, um, and I mean that as an economic liberal um, p definition, we have a system that is, ex is almost communist for the, for the very wealthy and very rich. Not that it's bad to be wealthy, I think it's great, but <laughs> you, cannot, uh, you cannot have a system that people agree with when uh, if you fail as a bank, they bail you out, but if you fail as an individual, you go to jail. No, 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 no. This, this smells very bad. This will make people angry. And it is making people angry. And we're in Europe. We know how corrupt the governments of, and especially the ones of the European Union are. This r looks like still rich, but very much like the Soviet Union. And um, I remember the Soviet Union. <laughs> and my friends of my age in Poland and in Romania and in Eastern Europe, where I also worked a lot, they remember very well how corrupt and how inefficient the system was. And they all tell me, European Union, it's exactly the same thing. And I, remind, and I, look, at, I look at the names and say, well, it's the same people. Uh, it's only the sons of the people who used to be uh, uh, at the time. So usually when things go bad, there is one solution. And you take people's uh, focus into something else, which is usually war. And war has two advantages today. One is to take focus of people away from their problems and try to stick them together, although I'm not sure what it, how it works today in such a multicultural, multi-ethnic world. But there's another one, which is, um, uh, which is to go and grab resources. Now, Zimbabwe is not a real interesting democracy. Have you seen any interven military intervention to go and save uh, Zimbabweans in the last 20 years? Not really. But had they had oil, whoa, you need to bring democracy there immediately. Oh, how bad they are. Iraq, Libya, Syria, all countries where there is oil. When you cannot control them, when you cannot bribe them, you invade them. Nothing new. This is what empires did since the dawn of empires 10,000 years ago. And if you have to lie to get the war done, doesn't matter. You will do it. I'm sure you still remember that, even if some of you are young. Now, believe me, when you're on your receiving side of American democracy, or any empire, really, uh, it sucks. <laughs> you die by the millions, and you move away to other places, and you destabilize other countries. Before, after. It's never good. 
And, and this is key because it's part of the moral element of our societies. We used to believe, and in some cases we used to be, the best, morally. We used to be the, yeah, we had flaws, you know, there was slavery 200 years ago, but we fought against slavery, and we, we were the first ones to remove it. There was imperialism, but we decolonized. And at some point we said, yeah, look, we're great. Look how white knighting we are compared for, for everything, you know, if I take a, an analogy. But doing wars to grab resources, and it's not us, it's not you, it's not Americans, it's not the British, it's not the French, it's the elites that rule, right? But we have to face the people that have been bombed and have been humiliated who come to our countries and they don't make that difference necessarily. So they hate the fuck out of us. Not all, but that tension is existing. And we have to realize it's true. And I'm not saying I, I love everyone, kind of, but I'm not, I'm not against people. But I have to realize, uh, we have to recognize the reality of the world. Is that there's a lot of people, there are billions of people who don't, who don't like us. And actually, they don't like each other. No one likes each other in most of the world, in fact. And, and these tensions are growing, and you can feel them. You can see them in the last 10, 15 years. They are growing, and they are sometimes in France, sometimes in America, sometimes in Greece. And they grow, and then they get down, and then they grow bigger, and they come down. And, the, and now it's, it, it was in France this year. And, and, and the police is more and more hard on them. The police state, the surveillance is stronger and stronger. And, uh, and, and we have more and more intrusion and removal of our freedoms. And being born in the early 70s, you know, I, I was in this window of time, 1970s to the 1990s, where you really had freedom. You could joke about everyone, about anything. You know, you could joke about uh, handicapped people, Jews, blacks, uh, you had racist jokes, but you did it together with them. And they had jokes back, and this is how you create brotherhood, this is how you create friendship, when you can joke, when you can say things, and say, hey, you look stupid, or, oh, okay, okay, and they say, well, no, you look stupid, and then you laugh, you have a beer or a drink or something. I get along with people, I used to work in Israel, in, in Saudi, simultaneously, I mean, uh, in Africa, in, in, I get along with everyone, because I can joke, and I, I have open-minded, but today, this is not allowed anymore. Today is everyone on his own, and, you're, and because you're not allowed to, to talk and joke, and then the hatreds start to happen, because they are, we are breeding, uh, first of all, there are, there are differences, but on top of those differences, you create the hostilities, you create the, the, these tensions, and you, you increase them instead of, instead of making them smaller. And the government's intrusion in our lives make this even more difficult. We're all not scared, it's not the world, but we all apprehend the fact that we could have our YouTube channels disappear like that, or books on Amazon not be depublished. I mean, what the fuck? One day there's going to be a guy who takes a gun and goes to, and goes to YouTube and, 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 and make a massacre. I mean, this is stupid. This is not how you manage a society. And yet, this is what's happened in the last 20 years. We have increased something that looks very much like George Orwell's 1984. And it's worrisome, because I used to like my 1970s and 1980s world. You had fun, you could talk with, with people, you could joke, you, can, you, you really had this idea of brotherhood between people and between uh, nations and between uh, cultures, and you, had, you could discover people. Then there was no racists in the 70s and 80s. I mean, it was great. Now, it's everywhere. And, every, and now everyone is a Nazi, which is also incredibly stupid because then you devalue the, the terms and you devalue the, 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 the history. Anyway, in my opinion, but again, think by yourselves, and I'm summarizing, we're getting to a dead end. This is not going to survive very long. This society cannot continue very long. Now, I predicted that the key, the moment of greatest danger starts in 2020. We're getting near. Am I right? Am I wrong? Was it, did I predict it too soon? By five years? By ten years? I don't know. But certainly, I believe that there is no way we can change this direction. It will have to reboot. It will have to collapse. Now, there's three ways to, to, to do that. Let's assume it does happen. And we're going to see what it means. But 
there's only there's three ways you can approach problems like that in life. The first one is to say, okay, let's be zen about it. So let's maybe society will say, okay, we have to reboot everything. Fine. We shake our hands, we roll up our sleeves, we work. Or we get completely shocked and scared and like the proverbial um, rabbit in front of the in front of the, the, the flashlight you freeze you know in the fight or flight uh, mode you also have frozen and people will not know what they do say, oh there's no money uh, there's no food in the supermarkets what can I do or people <laughs> become really upset I don't know I've not been there and and what I can see, however, is that we're not civilizations, and I should include really most of the world of that, uh, in, of the world in that. We're not civilization of responsible citizens. We're consumers. We're just taxpayers and consumers. Most of us are clueless about most things in life. Right? We have no mentors. I mean, not you in this room. But generally speaking, people have no mentors. Education is, is, uh, is mostly done by TV instead of, instead of the family. And then you go to the indoctrination that the school is. And they inject you some crazy, stupid ideas. Uh, conformity to, to, be, uh, to be in such uh, in a way that the powers that be like you to be. And obedience and, and, and no more information. That's why they don't study. You don't study history anymore. It's just propaganda. It is 1984's. Uh, world that we live in. Uh, we live in little boxes, we travel in little boxes, we work in little cubicles boxes for what? Spreadsheets on a computer? We don't really know what we actually do for work. This is why I left the industry at some point because I said well, they asked me too much uh, bureaucratic stuff. I'm, I'm, you see, in business I was kind of special forces guy. I go open a market. So fuck the rules. I open the market. You know, you don't ask the people who jump in Normandy to, to, to make a, a status report every two hours about uh, where did they jump and what did they do. No, you, you go to and do, take the fucking objective and you kill as, ma as many as the motherfucking enemies that you can. In my case, it was the competition, of course. But when the company says, oh, no, no, you cannot sell this this way. Yeah, but I brought you $2 million in three weeks. Oh, no, but you didn't respect the rules. But fuck the rules. You want the money or not? Because I can keep it. Oh, no, no, that's not right. We're going to have to fire you. Well, first of all, I'm going to sue you, and then you can fire me. But this is not the way men want to work, by the way. Rules and regulation. You have an objective, you go and you take it. No wonder you have so much depression in the workplace. We eat stuff that comes from boxes, and, um, and that, is, that is crap. And <laughs> it's funny because people say, oh, did you watch the, zombie, the latest zombie flicks? I love, I love movies. And I say, I don't need to watch zombie movies. I can take the bus in the morning. <laughs> we already are uh, zombies with our phones. And, 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 and it's, um, I'm a bit old school for that. So it doesn't work. So this system, I think, is unreformable. unreformable and it's not, not going to change. Forget revolutions. Forget changing the world. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Look at f Black Fridays. If you want, to have a, you want to vaccine yourself against humanism and against the beauty of, of mankind, just or humankind, go to a Black Friday and you see the zombie apocalypse is already here. People are just insane. And it doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just that this is the way we've ended up programming. And you know, uh, Charles Bukowski wrote in, in one of his books that the world would not end in a nuclear bang. Maybe it will, I don't know. But that was an interesting sentence, and he, comma, it will be, it will end uh, overflowed by um, a notion of shit. And I found that this was typically Bukowski's interesting uh, prose. And by the way, all of what we do today, we do it on credit. <laughs> because we want things now instead of the proverbial, you work and then you buy stuff that you need. No, you buy what you want and you do it on credit. And so people get enslaved by credit because debt is something that you have to pay tomorrow which means you have to work tomorrow and infinite debt means infinite work in the future which means slavery this is why they want you to be indebted 
It's a great system. So it's not going to work. And because we're here among great men, think of, of what men used to be in the generation of my father. So they used to be great men, even on how they look. Today, as we say in French, it's n'importe quoi. I don't know how you translate this. In, in it's, it's nothing. It's strange. Even the alphas, they look like shit today. And as a woman, you can still them, see them in Poland, and in Czech Republic, and in Romania, and in Russia, and in China, and in Japan. Women used to be women. Today, it's like an early 20th century prostitute. I mean, it's, uh, it makes no sense. So no, no wonder people are also failing in their mind, and you have so much depression. Uh, antidepressants are at the all-time high consumption in, in the world. 30% 30, 30 of men, 40% uh, of women in, in America, I believe, in France, it's certainly, actually France is the highest in the world, are consuming antidepressants. Remove the antidepressant, by the way, very fast, and you will have an interesting surprise of, of mental collapse and mental fall down. So the system goes down, I, I think. The problem is the consequence, because we are such an intermingled world of just-in-time production and supply chain and delivery, that if the system collapses, <coughs> you start to have more and more of the production and delivery of goods that fall down and stop. And if that happens, you have panic, like it sometimes happens when you have natural catastrophes. And if the panic grows, then things have to stop. The hospitals, they can't operate independently forever. After one or two weeks, you have no more, no more supplies. Actually, after a few days, you have no more supplies in hospitals, in supermarkets. And then people start to be treated uh, on the streets, in, in the schools, in the stadiums. And then, eventually, the power stops. And if the power stops, oh, we go in the dark. And we go really in the dark. I'm not saying this will happen. I'm saying the chances that this happens starts to be very, very big. And if we go in the dark, well, then it's somewhere we have not been into since the fall of Rome. So I, I'm not going to, I don't want to scare you so much, and now starts the good news, the, the good part of the presentation, the very, to summarize. But we can study this when other civilizations did collapse. The Mayas, the Vikings in Greenland, the, the, the many, many cases, Rome, the Soviet Union, and, and we see that, yes, poverty increases when this happens. People suddenly find, find themselves with nothing because a, a big flat screen TV without electricity or without a society that works, it's, it's meaningless. You have more and more violence, more and more uh, crime. You have gangs who suddenly find themselves in their natural habitat, who take power. And eventually they will become the new government. But that's a, that's a longer story. You have militias that set up, like in Yugoslavia, like everywhere there is, there is tensions. Eventually people group in, in militias, of course. And people move because they want to be with, them, with people and in areas where they don't get hunted down by the militias or by the gangs. So like in Yugoslavia, like in the partition of India and Pakistan, like, like every time there's been like the creation of Israel, every time you have some, some major shift in, the, in the, the population, you have people moving, and, and this is dramatic. It's, it's, it's tragic. And most of the time, they end up in refugee camps. This is very dangerous to be in a refugee camp. And when things are really bad, you can count on one thing to happen. The great exterminator of humanity that has been around and waiting for the last 100 years, but has been always here, always among us, which is illness. And once in a while, when we're weak, when our immune systems are down because of war, because of fatigue, of illness, the illness comes and the virus hits. And then you have, after World War I, 60 million people killed by the Spanish flu. And you have the plagues, and you have all these things that are coming back. It will come back if, if we get into this scenario. So I'm painting a dark scenario here. And once again, think by yourselves. It may not go to this, to this level, but it could. So the question is, as men, we're supposed to think about the future, 
ex hope for the best, but prepare for, for the worst. Because if nothing happens, it's like insurance. You're not, you don't cry because your insurance on your house uh, hasn't worked because the house didn't burn, right? You, you're happy that you have insurance, but you, and you're happy that your house didn't burn down. But just in case, you want to have some money in the, on the side, you want to have some clothes ready to go, because if your house burns down, you want to, to be able to, to take care of you and your family for while the insurance pays and while you can get into a new house and so on. Well, what if civilization burns down? You want to have something on the side to be ready for, you know, be safe and, and feed yourself and your family and your, and your groups of, 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 of people that you like. And... Um, restart eventually so my idea was this idea of sustainable autonomous base which i explained in my books but some the basic thing is whether you live in the countryside in a in a suburban house or in the projects uh, or in in a very small small non-common air place like a, a boat or I've, I've seen people in caravans and things like that there's seven things you need to think about to be to be autonomous Think about how you get your water. Do you, do you have enough to store it, to filter it? To, uh, in, this is where I live. I have, I have fountains. I have many sources of water. But uh, you can filter water. You can store it. You can use it wherever you live. So think about water. First, first element, very important. Second element is food. Do you have enough food at home to, to sustain for yourself and your family for a while? And how long? One week, two weeks, three weeks? Then after a while, you probably need to think about how about, how about you're going to produce your own food, food of quality and, 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 and food that is, that is nutritious for you. Not everyone can have a garden, of course. This is my garden. But, um, but this is the food I produce. Uh, it's super good. It's super tasty. I do it in small quantities. I'm not 100% self-sufficient. But I, I learn how to do it. So you can do it on the balcony and learn. It's the skill that matters. You don't need to have your, your, your farm necessarily today, but it's something that you learn how to do. Again, some of the food I produce in my, in my house, my farm. And then you can have your animals. So you can increase step by step. And you can hunt or fish. And indeed, you can store, you can store some of the food that you need uh, for, in case you have, you have bad times. Third element is health and hygiene. How can, you, how can you ensure that you have the best immune system in case of problems, that you are fit, as fit as possible? This is my big problem. <laughs> I, love, I love food too much. How you can maintain a level of, of hygiene that is enough, not too much, but good enough so that you don't get the silly, the silly infections and the silly things. Not too much because you, you need to get your immune system ready to, to fulfill. So this is why it's great when kids play on the ground and they get filthy and all that. After that, you clean them. But it's good that they play in the dirt. Um, uh, have good dental hygiene, of course. Uh, avoid contaminations, if possible. You know, get fit. You know all that, because this is also part of being, of being a great man. And I think develop your, for, for a great immune system and a great health, develop also the mind, the spirituality that goes with, uh, in my case, I do meditation a little bit. I don't look like a guy who does meditation, but I do uh, once in a while. And, and it's really great to focus on, on being equ equilibrated, not be angry, not have fear, and so on. And yes, you can have some medication and, and learn how to, to treat some, some of the problems, medical and health problems that you may have. Number four is energy. Produce what you need, but learn to need very little. So I have solar panels in my farm, but in reality, what do you need electricity for? Okay, if you want to really please your wife, have the dishwasher uh, running. And, the, and, the, and the, the washing machine, but that's, that's it. Then you have a, few a little bit of electricity. You don't need a lot of, of electricity. Today we are crazy because we have computers, TV, and uh, you don't need a lot. Maybe the fridge. And at the worst, make your own. Make your own energy. Cut your trees. Make your, uh, make your heating. This is a very large topic that I explained very deeply in the books, but at the worst, you have very rudimentary energy that is okay for, for you. Number five is knowledge, skills, but also what makes our civilization, whatever is yours, by the way. 
the literature, the music, the stuff that you want to keep with you for the next generation and what you teach the next generation. There's a, the guy who says often, oh, what kind of world we're leaving to the, to, the, to the next generation? Well, fuck that. What kind of generation are we living, are we living the world? Are we, re, are, we, are we raising our kids to be real good men and women or are we relying to the state to make them slaves? No, 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 we have to take care of our children and of the new generations and learn the skill, the manual skills. You can be a banker, you can be a salesman, but learn how to plumb, how to put electricity, how to, 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 to make all this. Uh, yesterday there was a great example on that. Uh, so yeah, number six is defense. I was hesitating to put this image or this one, but since it's a men's conference, we'll keep this one. Defense is about recognizing that not only do you have the right to defend yourself and your family and, and your people, it's your duty. Because if you don't, whoever attacks you will attack someone else after you. Whether it's a burglary or a murder or whatever, or a rape, your job is to stop the fucker. And it's your duty. And your duty is above the laws. So some people, they say, oh, but we cannot do the laws. Fuck the laws. You defend yourself. I'm not saying that you have to kill people. No, I'm saying you defend yourself and you neutralize the aggression. By any means necessary, but you neutralize the aggression. The law is, in fact, agrees with that when you actually look at the law in most countries. Now, some countries are less uh, have a regress like in the UK that you have almost no rights to do but in most of the countries you can do you can do a lot of things now can you guess who said this sentence I do believe that when there is only a choice between cowardice and violence I would advise violence Gandhi exactly I'm happy you say that so countries today like Switzerland, like Israel, like Russia, like China, they still agree with this idea. We don't take any fuck. If they fuck with us, we'll fuck back 100 times bigger. This is how it should be. Yeah, Gandhi understood that. Smart guy. So you think about where you live. You think about physical defense. You think about the environment, the neighborhood. This is, again, it's a big chapter in the books, but you learn how to defend physically against, against people. You know, protect your, your, zone, your, your zone, try to understand body language, understand where you go, where you don't go, how you diffuse the escalation of violence when necessary and how you accelerate it when, when necessary. Learn martial arts. You know, I do Sistema and I do Muay Thai, but you can do a lot of other things. You have Krav Maga, you have um, so many things. Jiu Jitsu, you have MMA, you have uh, some. And g get to learn how to use the most efficient tools that there are, which are, which are guns, long guns, uh, handguns, whatever. And remember that the state wants you to be disarmed. I think this picture was done here in, in Poland uh, 70 years ago or more. But the state wants you to be disarmed because who's killing people in history? Is it mass murderers? Is it Ted Bundy? Yeah, they kill a little bit of people. But who kills people is the state. It's the state who commits genocide. Usually, Socialist, the National Socialist, or the in this case Mexican social, Socialist, the Soviet Socialists, uh, the Vietnamese or the Cuban. I mean, the list is long. About 100 million people killed in the 20th century by the socialist state around the world. And so we need to realize that the armed citizen is the only guarantee against tyranny. The only one. It's not democracy. Democracy is a byproduct of the armed citizen. This is something that very few countries understand, but it's fundamental. So eventually you have militias, like in Kurdistan, they had all this shit for the last 10 years. Well, they have armed themselves and they found militias. So eventually this is what's going to happen. And number seven, very important, this is where it's going to be where the next presentation is going to be uh, mostly about, I believe, is the social link, the social bond between people. Because here's a, here's a secret, you're not going to survive alone. For a while, yes, but eventually you need to survive as a tribe, at least as a family, but you have to group yourself with your neighbors, with your friends, with, and it will happen over time, but you could prepare that now. And it means that you have to think 
like we used to think when there were villages, when people were living in small communities. We live in cities today, and the city you have the an anonymity. This is why you can do a pickup artistry, right? Because no one will recognize you after that. But do that in a small village. If you're a pickup artist in a small village, the father of the girl will come to you and beat the fuck up. And if you start again, they cut your balls off. Any culture <laughs> throughout the story of humanity. In the city, this doesn't happen <laughs> because, hey, who cares? You go and you dance. I've seen the, I mean, I've never been a one, but I know, I know how it works. And uh, yeah, you can do that in the village. But on the other hand, people stick together against the foreigners, the people from the next village. <laughs> You know, and, uh, and, but this mentality is something we need to get back because we have lost it. And that means the bonds of friendship, the having drinks, sharing. And, and today, what I see great in these conferences is that you have a sense of bond. You have a sense of, of, of brotherhood between men. And it's between men. You don't care about women friends. It's irrelevant. Who cares? But you have friendship between men and you protect the woman. And you get back the ideas of celebrating and realizing the cycles of nature. Because this is the base. This is, the, this is what makes you, keeps you alive. It's understanding the environment that is around you. This is what ecology used to be about. It's not about, oh, save the planet. No, 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 no. It's about understanding that you see it in the spring, you harvest in the summer, you prepare for the winter in, in autumn, and you rest in the winter. And repeat. Otherwise, you die. This is how... The, the people in at least the Northern Hemisphere th think. And, uh, and it's very important. And celebrate. The harvest is done. Yeah, we have a big party. And that's where you meet women and so on for the winter. A and so on and so on. I'm not saying we have to go back to the Middle Ages. No. But we have to understand that we live in a fragile world where everything is uniform. We need to reinvent complexity and reintegrate complexity, but not complication. Complexity is, you know, relationships are complex. Uh, the way you live and the way you manage your friendships are complex. You need to embrace that. As Dimitri Orlov, a friend and writer, says, you need to collapse often and collapse quickly and soon. You don't wait. You don't wait forever. It doesn't mean that you live in a hut, in, in, in a cabin in the woods. That's also a mistake. I always say plan A, plan B. Plan A is you have a career, you, you get the best career, the best man that you can be, the best job, the best money that you can have, the best woman, and so on and so on. But plan B, if, if shit hits the fan, you have, you have another plan. And the more these two things are harmoniously working together, the better. So simplicity. So in the end, the choice is yours. You can slob on, uh, on your couch, just as you know, woman or anything else in life, jobs and whatever. Or you can uh, be prepared, but it doesn't matter. The, the idea is that those who will survive are those who will create the world of tomorrow. So I'm not a pessimist. I'm not, I'm not black-pilled. I'm super happy because whatever happens, the world of tomorrow will be the world that is created by the men who will survive. And my instinct tells me there's not going to be SJWs and feminists and, and, and all that, and socialists and all that crap in the world of tomorrow because by definition, this is what kills the world. What makes a world thrive, it's great men, great women, complementing each other according to your morals and your, your uh, I, I'm, I'm not a moralist, I'm certainly not someone who says do this, do that. But this is the harmony that makes a new world. And by definition, this is what's going to happen. The question is, are we going to be part of it? Are you going to be part of it? I hope I will. I hope my children will. And I do everything for that. And that is what I hope the women around me recognize me for to be as a positive. It's not easy because we live in a world where you know, they get money anyway by the state. So you have to work hard and you have to work most importantly for you first. So as we all say, you know, be the best man you can be, also works in this situation. So with that, I thank you very much. And I'll be here now and for the next two days to take any questions and have any chat with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, Piero, we have time for uh, two questions right now. If you guys have questions in the audience, you can raise your hand. I'll come over to you. Any questions? If not, we will go on a break.
Richard, there you go. Oh, of course he does the Brit. <laughs> Fucking Brett. Red coat. The red coat's here. Uh, so um, one of the things you were talking about with the political correctness and telling jokes, there's um, a Slovenian philosopher called Slavoj Žižek. He said in the Yugoslav army, the way for dealing with that for Serbs to serve alongside Croats and Bosnians is you had to tell jokes about your culture. You'd have to say the dirtiest, most foul joke and about how awful your culture is in order to move forward. Do you think that's a useful discipline that maybe we should bring back? I think that this is something that, by the way, the British, which ha have, in my opinion, the, the best humor uh, in, in, in all of the world, in the different cultures, you know, from Monty Python to have this great self-depreciation humor. I mean, they're not self-depreciation in other things, but in humor, they know how to make fun of themselves, not taking yourself uh, seriously, and it's very important. Uh, Jewish humor as well is very, very interesting. I mean, I've heard the, the most anti-Semitic jokes coming from in the synagogue, not, the, not even from Jewish people, but in the synagogue while there was the, 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 <laughs> uh, the last one they were saying me, um, according to women, there was, this was three weeks ago, was, I was going to the bat mitzvah of my niece, and <laughs> the, guy, the guy was saying, oh, you know, I'm divorcing and all that, but my wife is, is not, it wasn't, isn't Jewish, but, you know, and, and he was saying, you know, any, any woman that divorces, becomes automatically Jewish. Okay, why? Because it's never her fault and she never apologizes. <laughs> so this is untellable as a joke if I was saying it to me, but the guy, you know. So this, but what does, what does it mean? It means he recognizes some of the flaws of his culture and he's joking about it. So he's basically saying, you know, I don't take that as too serious, so it's okay. In Africa, I can tell you, I've heard the most <laughs> unrepeatable jokes between themselves and, I'm, and I was like well, even in the, in the 90s I was saying I could not repeat those but it's okay and then you because you know one of my let's say brother in arms is an African pan, pan African nationalist he wants Africa to be African and with Africans and he doesn't want uh, Africans to go to Europe he wants them to develop the countries where they are from where they're born and he says the most vile jokes about the intelligence and the penis size. And, but, but because of that humility, that showing, you know, you, you show your vulnerability, well, between men, because if, with women it doesn't work. You know, you, it, it, it's a hand that is, that, is, that is given to you, and you shake that hand, and you say, well, you know, it doesn't matter, because we also do, you know, in Italian we eat pasta, and, and in, Swiss, in Switzerland we're like, obsessed with money and, and saving and order and, and I am like that I'm, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it, in the end we're human we're brothers we are different yes we have difference and we respect the difference as to be who they are and yes we are different and it's great because this is how you learn I've learned lots of stuff from Africans I hope they have learned lots of stuff from me but I've, I've learned some amazing stuff some I don't use some I do use so everyone can teach everyone if you have, uh, well, almost, but, uh, but if you learn and if you have uh, um, this um, openness, but it doesn't mean you are open completely. You share, but there's a limit. You know, you don't, you don't give your daughters to be fucked like that. Right, hold on a second. You need to show your quality as well. But um, I may be going off track, but it's very important, I believe. At least it's my culture from the 70s and 80s. I, I know that for young people who are in the room today, who are, you know, who are born in the 2000s, this is not usual. This is weird. This is, and I, you know, this this is a strange culture coming from America, where you, oh, you hurt my feelings. You cannot say anything. Fuck the feelings. But I understand that young people they don't have the fuck you money and the self confidence that I have or my generation has, maybe. I understand that it's hard for them and say, well, if I say a joke like that at, jo at work, I lose the job. And I say, well, fuck the job. If you lose the job because of that, it's not worth it. But then I have to remember, yeah, I'm 47. I made a lot of money. Okay, that's why I say that. But the young guy of 23, he can't. I understand. But it's a fucked up world. That's all the time we have. Give it up. Thank you, Thank sir. You.